Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Nicole Matthews, and I'm with the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition. Um, it's National Native American Heritage Month, and we're going to be doing a series of conversations called Strengthening Our Circle, and this is week one. Um, so just to get us started, I'm just going to ask the staff all to introduce themselves, and then we'll talk a little bit more about um, the topic for today. Linda? Hi, my name is Linda Thompson Wetland, and I am working at MUSAC as the operations director. Thank you. Christine? Bonjour. Christine Davidson is my English name, Giwatayashik Indigo, Magizi and Dodame, Gawaba Baganika Gishkonigan, and Don Juba. I'm Giwatayashik, I'm Eagle Clan, and I live up here in the White Earth Reservation. And I've been with MUSAC for, oh, holy smokes, almost 16 years now, real soon. So, and I'm the Education and Prevention Coordinator. Thank you. Afton. I'm Adag Yapi. My name's Afton. I'm an enrolled member of the Oglala Lakota tribe, as well as Santee and Sisseton. Um, Minneapolis and Minnesota are my homelands, and I lead our National Clearinghouse Project. So welcome all. I'm super excited. We do have one more joining us. Um, and a little, um, I suppose I can do a full introduction of myself. Um, Nicole Matthews is my English name and Spirit Bird Woman is my Indian name. Um, my family is from the wider band of Ojibwe, um, although they all live on Leech Lake. So um, I certainly feel very much tied to the Leech Lake Reservation. And yeah, I've been at MUSAC for going on 21 years. So, Anita, welcome. We we're just doing introductions. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. I was just making sure my my mic was on or it was plugged in. Hi, you guys. Um, Nita Medicine Crow. I am from, I was born here. Uh, actually, HCMC in Minneapolis, um, but my reservation is Crow Creek, Dakota, and they are out at Fort Thompson, right by Chamberlain, South Dakota, but I've been in the Twin Cities probably the last 20 plus years. So I've been here, around here, so glad to be here. Thank you. So one of the conversations that we have had a lot at MUSIC and has certainly come up in our um, in our world, and you know, we've heard um, many conversations in Indian country um, about um, our identities of who we are as Indigenous people. We've heard conversations about pretendians. We've heard um, conversations about who's native, who gets to claim they're native and not enrolled or not enrolled. What does that all mean? Um, and really having conversations about what, um, what does that mean for all of us who are doing this work? How did we get here thinking about colonization and the impact of colonization and um, what that has also done to us um, and how that continues to divide us. Um, and also how we are also working to reclaim our indigenous values, how we are also working to strengthen those community connections and, commu and our connections to each other as relatives. Um, and so one thing that MUSAC has never been afraid of is having hard conversations um, or maybe even messy conversations. And I think that's been um, a strength of our, ours for a long time. And, um, so I just wanted to open it up in that way and um, see if anyone has, oh, and we have Rebecca who has joined us. So I'm gonna give her a minute to introduce herself. Thank you, Rebecca, for joining. 
I'm Faith Awashde. Good day to everyone. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I just want to be a part of the conversation and support everyone today. So thank you, Nicole. It's a good conversation today. Yes. It is a good conversation. So based on um, some of the stuff that I've mentioned, does anybody have any, um, any input or thoughts about, about our topic today? And let me ask this. One of the things I've really been thinking about is, um, you know, when we think about like how we got here and I always think about like when I'm talking about, um, you know, sexual assault and um, how colonization has really impacted violence in our communities, right? How, you know, we can, we can trace where that started, right? If we look at boarding schools, if we look at um, colonization and what has happened to our women and to our relatives um, and to our people in boarding schools and even before boarding schools, right? The um, the way that our people were harmed. But I also talk about like all the federal policies that um, were really put on us intentionally um, to strip us from our connections with each other, right? We're put on reservations, little parcels of land that maybe um, weren't where we originally were. We were we were moved around, right? Like we have relocation. So we we're moved around from where our ancestral lands were. Um, we were separated from each other and um, and pitted against each other. And then we have this notion of blood quantum that was put on us really as a way to strip us from our land and our resources and to um, for an external agency, the government to tell us who's native and non-native and who um, should get, you know, whatever parcels of land and not. But now we use it essentially um, to decide who's native and non-native and who um, and who we're going to claim and not claim. Right. And and I feel like it's um, it's really harmful. Right. So my mom is enrolled. Um, on white earth and my family's enrolled in white earth and my biological father is Chinese. And um, so I'm not enrolled. And, you know, so my kids can claim um, through the Johnson O'Malley Act, like they can still claim that they're native in the schools because of that descendancy. But after my children, my grandchild can, is not considered native because you can't claim, you know, you can only claim so much. So at what point are we becoming invisible, right? They're still part of our family. They're still our relatives, but now they're not native. So I guess that's, um, you know, some of the things that I have thought about. And, and I think the most harmful thing, the most hurtful things are when it's people in your own community that are um, that are using that to tell you you're less than, or you don't belong, or um, or you shouldn't be included. So I'll just start with that. Those are some of my thoughts. Just that, just a little bit of that. I will, I will add too that, so part of this messy conversation is that there's no script or roadmap for how to have it, right? Like we're all um, trying to do good work in the world, trying to raise families free from sexual violence, um, the work that we do every day out there in the world is to eradicate the conditions that make sexual violence possible, right? But so it's both like in the workplace, it shows up, it shows up in our own families, in our own communities, it shows up in our own minds and how we um, value ourselves or how we are in relationship to the people around us. And so it's like messy and complex and real and it's painful. And it's also liberating because we are able to um, have these conversations or start to kind of like feel our way around how to talk about this. Because what I think what the Minnesota Indian Women Sexual Assault Coalition really values is like how do we how do we take that messy journey and try to make it a little bit better. And that means that we have to do our own internal work, but we also have to do policy work within our organization too in the way that we have relationship with other organizations or people doing this work or trying to do it in a good way, right? And so some of the conversations that we've been having internally, are, or I'll, I'll stay, say this, is that I remember when MUSAC was first being formed way back in the day, 
you know, in the early 2000s, there were conversations about, do you have to be enrolled to be um, a member of MUSAC? Do you have to be enrolled to be on staff, to be a circle keeper, which is our board of directors, right? So these are really important and uncomfortable conversations because we all have lived experience and we have deeply held feelings and ideas about it. And so I just, I just really appreciate that we're having this kind of conversation and, and seeing what happens and exploring it. So yeah, that's what I would add. And I should also say that we did land on as a coalition that no, like we're not gonna police each other's identities and have, have you produce a card that says you, you're native enough to be a part of ending sexual violence, right? That's something that just didn't sit right with us on every level, spiritually, philosophically, practically, like, right? It takes all of us to end it. So yeah, that's what I would add. Thank you, Christine. So yeah, so I'm a part of Milk. This is Rebecca. Hi, everyone. I'm happy for those that can join. I want to do a little bit of storytelling too. So we know 1491, we know what that means, right? So I'm not in Minnesota. I'm a part of the Millsack team. Yes, I am. Love this team. But I sit in the mountains of Pennsylvania. So I'm on the East Coast. And Pennsylvania is an interesting relationship to Indian country, quote unquote, right? Air quotes. So the Carlisle, the first boarding school, the template, the pilot project of the government happened 15 minutes from my house right now, which is the Carlisle Indian School. So we have twice a year, all of our local Pennsylvania natives, whether they moved here from Pine Ridge or Seminole or Clinkett or Alaska, people who live here go to the Carlisle School. We take care of the grave sites, which we know repatriation is happening, where the graves are um, at this point starting, the, the, the children that died at the first boarding school are returning home for their ceremonial rites, okay? So that is a celebration, right? The children are returning home. So storytelling. So again, I'm 15 minutes from the Carlisle gravesite and the school, and yet I worked for 10 years at a YWCA, okay? And we serve domestic violence, sexual violence, sex trafficking, homelessness, veterans affairs. It was a very comprehensive environment. And we had all nations a part of the YWCA serving this community. More than three, it was, it was not more than three times. It was three folks that grabbed a hold of me. They knew I was a native woman at the YWCA. And one woman, I'm going to speak on one storytelling. She whispered, Rebecca, could you please speak to me? I was like, uh, yeah. And she took me out of my office under the stairs. Like we hid under the stairs and she was whispering. So Rebecca, she said, um, she's a self-identified African-American black woman. And she said, my great, my, not her great grandmother, her grandmother died in the Harrisburg hospital and her auntie was there. And she said, Rebecca, I think I'm native too. And I was like, okay, I'm here for you. What, I'm, I'm here, tell me everything. And she said, my auntie sang a song with my grandmother on her deathbed and sang ceremonial rites, a, 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 you know, a death song. And in the Harrisburg Hospital, two miles from the YWCA building where we were hiding under the stairs talking. And she said, my grandmother was at the Carlisle Indian School and I'm Navajo. And I didn't know I was Navajo until my grandmother was on her deathbed at the hospital. And my auntie, who also was in the Carlisle School, sang a Navajo, you know, the right of, I don't know Navajo ways, so I don't want to mess it up, but they sang the song. And, her, and my coworker, her name is Joanne, that's all I'm going to say. She didn't even know she was Navajo or part Navajo or descendant or enrolled or not enrolled. And if she didn't even know her identity because going through the boarding school, her grandmother went to Carlisle. She was a descendant of Carlisle. She was released from Carlisle and entered this world of central Pennsylvania. And she just presented and married as black folk. So what, like, what does that mean to our identity? So Joanne, no last names. She had to hide me under the stairs to share this conversation with me. 
and what, what does that mean to her children, her grandchildren, and to her own identity where she presented and only knew she was black, but she wasn't. She was um, indigenous and black. So all of these conflicting, like we have a thousand experiences across Indian country, but does Joanne mean less than Nicole or Linda or Afton or Christine? What does that mean when we're bringing people home? And, and teaching her ways. And is Joanne not allowed to be learning her ceremonial song and translating that language? Like, it's a lot. So I just wanted to share that, that there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of ways, right? And that's not even including foster care and adoption and all the other air quotes, right? So we'll be, thank you for letting me just share that today. Thank you. Thank you. Linda, <clears throat> Nina. I just, I want to share, I, I just, going, I think it, it was, it's all systematic because of what the goal was, and that was to, to make sure that we didn't know our families. It was to make sure that we didn't know our culture, and because it was erasure, they wanted to make us invisible because I had the um, foster care experience, and I it went through quite a bit of abuse, childhood abuse. Um, during that time and so it took me a while but I always knew I was not Anglo Christian because I was forced to go to to um you know Sunday school and um communion and that sort of thing so I had I was pretty much forced to do that and I just I never it never felt wet right in my heart um and then so yeah it's been a big journey it's a big journey for those of us who got taken away from our families and that wasn't our choice either and so there's a lot of blaming in the community too and just microaggressions and just oppression and lateral oppression and aggression and so um yeah I just wanted to speak on that a little bit of just that it's systematic and the government meant to do that to us and to keep us divided, keep us away from our families. And I was fortunate enough to find my family and I was fortunate enough to make connections. And so I even got a, my Dakota name is Dakuye Odeween. And that means um, searching for relatives woman because I was taken away and I, it's been a whole journey um, reconnecting with my family and then learning my, my own teachings. So. But I'm grateful for that because a lot of people, they don't get that. You know, they don't find that connection. And then there's shame involved with that too. Shame in yourself and then shame. Sometimes your own family will shame you too. And you, there's nothing that you could have done about that. That was something, that's some things that I had to go through in my life is just, a, um, what is that called? Not admitting to that because it, like I said, it's not my fault because there was shame in that. So it took me a while to um you know sort through my my own stuff um there was a lot of shame and unworthiness too so yeah just decide share that part of kind of my experience in the foster care system thank you yeah there's a lot of shame and like internalized stuff right like we internalize all that stuff and that shame that doesn't belong to us because of the systems that were put on us sorry Afton go ahead no, yeah, kind of just going off of that, um, when we talk about boarding schools, and there are a lot of descendants of the boarding school survivors, and that it does show up in the second generation of um, of households, maybe where there is foster or um, place in, in within their kinship systems, um, and unfortunately being placed with non-relatives. And it really does remind me of... Um, of when we did a lot to preserve our families and what does that mean to do what is necessary for our survival. And so whether it's reaching out, tracing back our roots, um, whether it's um, finding our family stories, our family designs, there was an article that came out of, of talking about what is your beadwork and, um, or what color are the beads and who claims you. And it's just like, we take these routes to find who we are because it is a necessary part of um, how we identify as ourselves. And it really goes back to when we were, um, when we did what was necessary during the reservation times of when through the Indian Appropriations Act is that we needed, um, we needed those services, we needed supplies to, for the sustainability of our future. And that there, there is some pride on those who did not enter 
um, reservations and who fought back. But there's also the part where it was necessary for a longevity of, of making sure that youth are safe, whether they're placed in boarding schools. Like I know from my great great grandma at the Genoa Indian Project, um, her name was Alice Walker and, um, and my family's a LaCroix. And that when they were placed there is because the she could not support her. And there was all this about being successful in, you know, a, a place that favors, um, like you said, a Anglo Christians, and that there is some shame. And, you know, eventually there, there was some white folks and some non-native folks who did come into our family, but that doesn't diminish the pain and, and the suffering that my family and the necessary things that, that happened in my family either. So I definitely do hear this, and I'm sure a lot of other families on here um, share the same perspective, but it doesn't take away from our Indianness and our claims to our people and our land and, and being more than one tribe. So I just wanted to share that too. So I hear you, Naida, and thank you for smudging. I think that when we do have the time to uh, quit surviving and living, that it makes more space for us to think about how things got to the way that they are right now. And the experiences that each of us carries with racism, and sometimes that happens right in somebody's own family, where there can be a disconnect and a great shame is put on to others in the family from other family members because of their own trauma. So yesterday I was looking and my brother, he, um, my mom is from Leech Lake and my dad is from Boys Fort. And um, I grew up in the city in Minneapolis on the South side. I was born in Bemidji, but then we came down for my dad to get work. Last night, my brother sent me a picture of a pipe stone um, Indian archive document and of the 12 names that are in there that I have five of them are my my mom and uh, some of her brothers and sisters and the other ones I know weren't were there are not on this particular document but I never thought about that stuff and how that affected my family and my life and my ability to parent when my mother was taken away as a little girl and brought there, which the way she views it is different than how I would, how I think of it because of what was going on in her home. They had a lot of kids, not a lot of resources. There was threats from all areas around her from the sheriff to my grandma, my grandpa, um, who was addicted was a threat in a lot of different ways. And my uncles, as they grew up, became more of a threat if they were using. And then the shame and embarrassment of not having food and all of the things that come at somebody. So um, when I was thinking of that and talking to her, it was in my 30s that I finally had time to listen to what somebody was talking about with historical trauma and with what can happen in our ancestral memories of our blood and our relatives that, you know, there is not just the trauma, there is a resilience and a strength that we carry also. So while I might, some people don't have enrollment cards and they don't or can't prove the connection because there was a distinct break between parent and child. And that was deliberate because we sh were supposed to learn how to not be Indian, how to not be native, how to not be indigenous. So there's great, great effort in a system that we did not create. When we look at where we came from tribally, and we hear the value systems, we listen to the language, we learn the songs, we participate in the ceremonies, then we start to feel like we are more at home. I guess if somebody wants an enrollment card, I could give you some, cause I do have some, but, um, and by the way, my two little granddaughters who are Dakota Assiniboine and Anishinaabe, 
They also are part Vietnamese from their mother, who was a psychiatric nurse practitioner for the um, for the Veterans Administration. She has fought to get her daughters enrolled because the world will treat them like they are Native, which for some people is very difficult and challenging. But you are can be resilient if you have support from behind with parents or family or caregivers that are compassionate and understanding and support you in being who you are. We can't pick and choose for people what happens when they're in the system, which you know can be foster care, adoption, or um, living with somebody who is not healthy in a lot of different ways, whether they have addictions or mental um, challenges or they're disconnected. And so as we're moving through this, the idea with all of these things that are challenging and, and working to destroy our communities, which includes domestic violence, sexual violence, and addiction and suicide. And on the other part is people trying to keep the language and keep the ceremonies and keep the circle. And what happens is if we look for ways to exclude our relatives, then we're breaking the circle ourselves. So I, I was looking at those documents and I actually on these ID cards, my blood quantum, which by the way, is just typed in numbers from a human was challenged by my real intelligent daughter-in-law who wrote letter after letter. And they sent me a letter, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and said, we've discovered through your documents that you're actually more than what we had you listed. <laughs> So they raised my blood quantum and that raised all of my families, including my mother's, because she had uncovered something. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change any of my life experiences. It doesn't change any of my trying to learn my songs or helping people. I am an advocate and I probably have been um, since I was a teenager, but I watched my mother advocate for um, other women. I, before there was an advocate job, she was going to St. Paul to, to help somebody get away from somebody who was hurting her. And I was in the back seat watching her, you know, not knowing what, what are we doing and why are we here? And we have a responsibility and an obligation to be good to each other. Every single one of us carries so much um, in way of just being who we are. So when we look for reasons to dismiss or exclude or to diminish or to put down our sisters and our brothers, we need to pause and think about that a little bit. And am I, am I enriching and holding the circle or am I trying to say who can and can't be in this circle? You can choose that for your own personal life and some people do for lots of really good reasons with boundaries. But in the circle of life, we are all a part of the same circle. So I think with those types of, um, you know, conversations, and I've been witness, I've listened to the, the conversation about, you know, I'm a full blood, I've kept my bloodline clean, I am supposed to um, do this and marry into my same tribe and I'm not supposed to be outside but you know all the things and she said that my friend said that's what my grandma told me and I said geez I'll be I'll be really happy if any of my grandkids just really find somebody who loves them you know at the end of the day because it's a really long journey if you're blessed enough to live and it would be good to have a good companion or a partner or good friends who sincerely care about you as a person. And as long as we continuously fight amongst each other, the oppressors who set up this system do not have to do too much. We will hurt ourselves. And they will, they will say, they see, look at, look at them. They can't even get along. <laughs> you know, so, but the truth is we can. And it is um, it is first with healing ourselves and then. Helping, helping our sisters and brothers 
you know, help them to heal and to support them by speaking words of truth. And how did this get to where it's at? And what am I doing that supports it? And how can I be a good relative to all of my relatives, not, not just the ones I pick? I was living in the city for many years. And then in my 30s, I moved to a reservation. I never had that um, lived experience. And I, in the city, everybody can have running water and lights and, and sewer systems. But when I moved there, we moved a trailer, which was substandard housing, but it, it was a trailer and we moved it and had no lights and no plumbing. So I never thought I would live without lights and it wasn't for too long and live without plumbing. And you start, you know, the world has a way to soften up your rough edges once you experience some things. And I thought I was so smart from the city, but the, the truth is the people of the Spirit Lake reservation or the Badewaka Oyate had a lot to share with me and they accepted me and my two children as members of their community and welcomed us in and I ended up learning more about their community than I knew about my own people because of what had happened in my families on both sides. Tama with my dad's side the boarding school and on this side was Pipestone and long-term effects with addiction and violence and just trying to survive. So I wanna say thank you for tuning in if you're listening. And I, I'm asking you to not just listen with your ears, but to listen with your heart because our people really need us to be good to each other in the best way. And if we can't, we can still be respectful and we don't need to um, cause any more anger and pain than's already been experienced. And conversations like this are good to make the connections where there's disconnection. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. One of the things too, that was amazing. Yes, if we could just be kind to each other because you know we are from regions, we have Alaska folks folks in Hawaii, the Southeast, right? And folks that are mixed that are back to, you know, post-Civil War reconstruction, people that are half Black, half Native, that's been a big movement in the last year, right? With George Floyd out of Minnesota. And I, I, and I wanna give space definitely for Minnesota folks and other folks to chime in even in the chat or on Facebook. But I do wanna story tell. So the East Coast, so I'm um, a, I'm Gypsy and Mohawk and uh, Oglala. So I am not the Mid-Atlantic Corridor, although that's where my family is from. But I've heard a lot of stories of our local folks, right? Um, and thank you, Becky. I'll read that in just a minute. But I want to tell stories from, you know, the East Coast. So for the last, freaking. 90, 80, 70, 60 years, people have to apply for federal recognition. Tribes, right? You have to apply. Every, every four years, maybe every eight, a tribe has to apply for federal recognition. But when a new president or Republican, Democrat, whatever, they, that goes to the bottom of the stack. So this is like all logistics and political DC stuff. They apply, a new president comes in, their federal application for federal recognition goes to the bottom of the stack because sovereignty is not always the highest priority. So there are two tribes, one in Virginia, one in New York. Their application kept being moved, every new president to the bottom of the stack. They didn't get recognition for decades. So I'm going to lean on the South for a moment. And I tell this a lot, because I was gifted with a story and I was given, you know, um, not authority. I was, I was gifted the story that I could share it in this, in these spaces. The most famous native human being on earth, Disney included, so sorry, because I know that's not the real story, but it's Pocahontas, right? Pocahontas is a well-known international cartoon, whatever. But yet her own tribe was not federally recognized for 90 years, more than that, 
for real since 1491 because that was Jamestown. <clears throat> Excuse me. But they got federal recognition, right, within the last eight years. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever, YouTube was happening. They had their own tribal regalia, their own songs, their own ways to powwow. The amount of you're pretendians, you're not native, these bad, 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 bad comments were happening on their powwow YouTube video. Horrible. You're pretendians, you're not really native. It's Pocahontas's Pamunkey people. Yet, when they got federal recognition, what does that mean? Now they're Indian, right? All of that. So that's the Southern experience. In New York, I was, I did, um, I'm a dancer, fancy shawl, and I did, um, what's it called? Uh, the New York Stock Exchange, ringing the bell. It was the first native, on this, um, Native One was the first um, company that was the New York Stock Exchange, whatever. So I was outside, I'm very naughty, I do smoke. I was outside smoking with a, the chief of this New York tribe. And we were talking and he, he shared with me, and this was the chief, when they got federal recognition, yay for the Shinnecock folks. But at that time, he said, you know what? People called us pretendians and fake Indians, and we, weren't, we couldn't possibly be Native anymore since 1491 and be in New York. And a lot of that community are very dark-skinned, right, because of hybrid love stories and mixed race. They are federally recognized, however. And the conversation we had was, you know, I feel like I'm a part of a big boy club because now we're federally recognized when they used to call us all the names, but now we're federally recognized. Now we're a part of NCAI, National Congress of American Indians. But at that point, it was like this moment of being a pretendian, fake, not real Indian to now you're federally recognized. What does that mean? And I remember going to NCAI conferences and I saw that man and I sat beside him because he sat in the back corner of the room all alone because people didn't know how to associate because of the violence that has been perpetrated because he wasn't once Indian enough, but now he's federally recognized. So all of these things are at play. And I know sovereignty is a thing. I know political identity is a thing. I know blood quantum is a thing. But if this is how we treat each other, where the first go-to moment of insulting another native is saying, well, you're not Indian enough. That's what happens in Indian country. So I'm, I'm gonna stop babbling, but from what Linda said, if we could love each other and be kind and be patient and understand our nations from the West Coast to the East, to the Southeast, to the North, our cultures are different, our ways are different. And some of us didn't, we didn't have the Dawes Act because they were colonized in 1491 in Virginia. So the Dawes Act didn't translate to Pine Ridge or the Midwest. I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna stop rambling, but all of these things are a part of our identities, right? So compassion and love and inclusiveness. I have something quick to add on that. Um, a lot of uh, a network for our communities seems to be social media. Um, and Facebook. And so the way we consume um, is pretty visual. So it's easy to scroll. And I, I've i seen some of the, the criticism of, of the Eastern tribes where there are Black natives. And I think a lot of it is misinformation or misunderstanding because um, I think it's difficult and it's not an excuse, but I think we need to do better as a community um, to continue these conversations into anti-Black or to overcome anti-Blackness. But it also makes me think of how there are um, those who do culturally appropriate, like there's hobbyists that have um, that have accumulated skills of quill work, of making roaches, high price items at a lower cost with materials that are used from us or um, that are traditionally traded items from their own home countries. And they sell them back to native folks here and they host their own powwow in Germany in Germany and a lot of those places that are um, that are in Europe that are totally disconnected and they're not contributing to our communities the way local artists do because they're offering a service and that could be often debated about their contribution to Indian country by offering items that are authentically made in a way that's traditional by non-natives. 
So it's kind of like the relationship and a, another conversation about pretendia and, and cultural appreciation versus appropriation is that these items are also getting sent to museums because they are items that are made of quality that, that could be even comparable minus the Indian identity. So it just, it makes me think that if we're on a visceral level of consuming native art, consuming native styles, native language, it's just like where it's hard to kind of differentiate pretendian cultural appropriation versus appreciation. So I think on the level of understanding mixed native identities, powwows and community, it really is a task that our own community needs to conquer because we seem to be pretty successful at calling out non-actual natives. Let's bring that energy back to our own communities. So that's kind of my point on that. I was just thinking about that. And I almost got suckered in to buying an item from Russia on Etsy. And I was so bummed out. So I'm always saying support local artists. <laughs> but that's my quick point I wanted to follow up on Rebecca. And thank you for saying that um, and sharing that story. Yeah, I love that. And, and I think like this conversation, right? Like it's messy too. Like that's the messy part too, right? Right. There are people that are um, not native that are claiming to be native and are making money off of it. Um, and there are people that are appropriating native culture. I mean, there were some years ago that there was um, a non-native man down in Sedona that killed several people because he built a sweat lodge, but didn't know how to build it safely and to like, and several people died and they had paid literally tens of thousands of dollars to go down there and, and die. Right. Um, because he didn't know what he was doing. And so, so there are real harms and also like there's a romanticism of, um, indigenous culture and of indigenous people. Right. And so it becomes very appealing, um, you know, people will say, well, I was Indian before Indian was cool, like, right, because now it's all of a sudden, like, the cool thing or whatever, um, and then there are those of us who have always been Native and feel less than because we're like, well, I'm not enrolled, or will I be accepted, or maybe my skin is too light, or, um, you know, and so, and so there's that, right, so it's, I mean, I think it's complicated. I think for for many years prior to coming to music, I, um, you know, I worked in a non-native program and we, uh, it was a um, domestic violence sexual assault program and we worked with the um, Mille Lacs band um, with the tribe quite often on our sexual assault services. And there were many other non-native programs that wanted to recruit me as their like native person, like in their organization. And I always said no, cause I, didn't want to, because I always thought it felt very token and it felt like, because I look similar to you, my skin's similar to yours, you feel more comfortable with me. And so I'm not giving you a pass on that. I'm not going to participate in that. Um, and when I applied for this job here, I was terrified because I had always felt like I didn't belong. Um, and it was really scary for me. And so coming to MUSAC um, was really more like a coming home and felt like I could finally show up in the way that I, that I really felt in my heart, but was scared to actually show up in those ways. Um, and so it has always felt like this is, this is just home for me. And this isn't like, this isn't like, you know, I'm working at a bank and then when I'm done, I'm, you know, done working, right? Like this is like my community and, and I care because it's my people, it's my relatives. And I don't get to like, take, I don't get to step away and pretend that it, it's not going to continue happening or that it's not impacted me and my family. Um, and so, you know, but I think there's still that, that shame and that peace and that um, invisibility of like, am I accepted? And then there's still people that will remind me that maybe I'm not as Indian as they are. Um, and so there's always someone that wants to knock you off your whatever um, and, and put you in your place, right? And, and that's where, you know, Linda, like you were saying, like the spirituality piece is like, it's important for us to, one, to have a solid identity, um, 
but also to be spiritually grounded and to remember like there's, there's an energy with that ugly stuff that comes at us too, right? Like there's a spiritual energy in that. Um, and there's ways that we can protect ourselves from that and to always be uh, in prayer and, um, and to protect ourselves and to, you know, whether it's through ceremony, however you pray, um, so that, you know, so it doesn't, so it hurts maybe a little bit less, even though it still hurts. And there's still times when I'm just like, you know, it brings me to tears. Um, and it, it hurts. It hurts when it comes from your own people the most. I talk about Thank you, Nicole. I talk about hybrid love stories because many of us are either mixed tribe, right? Mixed blood, we're black, we're Asian, we're gypsy, Hispanic, we're mixed bloods. And it does hurt when, when our own, I don't know, I don't know why the go-to is the biggest insult you can hear in Indian country is he, she, they are not native. Why is that the biggest go-to insult that happens on the moccasin trail or gossip and I don't know why we do that to each other but you know what we're in the anti-violence movement that means we're anti-racism anti-bigotry anti-oppression anti-violence we're anti-harm and it's people have made careers out of being very anti they have podcasts they have websites they have youtube channels all the things but you know we're we're trying to be healers, and this does not heal, right? And we got to bring each other together. Yes, there's pretendians. We're gonna name it. Of course, uh, what's his name? Cody? No, the trash dude from the '70s. I forget his name. The gray eyes, the tear trash dude. <laughs> yeah, it, it that's real. He was Italian. He made a gazillion dollars doing it. So we know it's real, right? And some of that was corporate business too. But when we're talking about real lives and ending violence, it is about love and compassion and bringing folks back in, not the PVC dude that did the shelter or the, the NEP down in um, Sedona, that $3,000 a pop, people died. They were breathing in PVC. That's what was on the NEP. He had the grandfather rocks. He, he learned from a Lakota man he lit the, the fire, he steamed the stones, and they breathed in the chemicals from the PVC over the um, NEP, or the sweat lodge. But at the end of the day, we it, is that going to drive our bus? Or are we going to be cool and like lift each other up and bring each other home and share? I don't know. I'm that's that's a, kind of what I'm thinking about, like the way that oppression shows up. Like, so there are tactics that hold up oppression, right? Divide and conquer, objectifying, right? So when you go to war with somebody, you have to objectify them enough so you can take life or destroy their, their being, their land, their, their identity, their culture, their everything, right? So there's, um, and if we break it down and think about the way that tactics are used so systemically that um, I hold it up and we can, if we can interrupt those and take personal responsibility, for how um, when I wake up in the morning, I have to make a choice every time how I'm going to respond to things that are said or done to me, right? Or that action or inaction that I take in any given moment, I can only have personal responsibility for myself. And to some degree, if we're talking about weaponizing identities, it's both a personal thing, but we have a responsibility within our workplace too, to do our best to put um, policy into place, to put practice into place. You know, for example, at MUSAC, we have uh, every morning at 9 a.m., we get together and we have conversations just like this, right? Um, we check in with one another to see each other and meet each other as human beings first, because we come from such different experiences. So part of it is like, how do we also not weaponize the gatekeeping, the, the power that we have as an organization, the money and grants and decisions that we have access to? How do we do that in the best way possible, right? So both that like personal and that workspace and our community space and all the things. So I, um, I, I just mostly want to name that it's our personal responsibility to do our own healing work. Um, I don't think any of us are above feeling anger or judgment or resentment or be like, I mean, so, you know, you see this color skin, right? And uh, 
I'll be someplace at a ceremony or, or somewhere and somebody will walk in, I'll be like, hmm, what are they doing here? Right? So I'm, I'm just a human being with my own experience that brought me to where I am, right? So I have to check myself. Like, I, obviously, I'm a light skinned Anishinaabe woman. So why wouldn't somebody else want to come to ceremony and be where they are, right? But hand in hand with that is a responsibility, you know, and often we've, you know, had group conversations about proximity to whiteness, right? And so what do we do with that um, privilege? And what choices can we make and what spaces can, you know, have that proximity to whiteness, what can we use, use it as a tool as a, you know, I, and I don't have the answers, but I'm saying every one of us can think about the ways that we have power and privilege in our own ways. You know, I'm straight, I'm female and I identify as female. Like I have all kinds of privileges that come with, you know, I live on my home reservation um, I have access to safe spiritual practitioners and people. I have a safe personal spiritual relationship with creation, right? And that's because I've had people support me ar around that. I've also had harm done to me in spiritual spaces, right? So part of it is like there's even privilege that comes with having safe spaces around you and safe people around you. So maybe I'm just offering, um, interrupting the people that are harmful or toxic or haven't done their own work set clear boundaries and we do that at work too we have to do that in our workspaces with the policies that we create um, even policies about if a harm doer shows up in our space what is our response going to be right what is our hiring policy going to be whether you're enrolled or not all these things like these are important decisions that we can um, really think ahead on right okay uh, okay, I'll stop talking now. <laughs> no, go ahead, Afton. I was even just thinking about when that came to mind, um, is that when we talk about predators and people who are entering our communities with an intention to hurt us, there's also um, an interest to exploit us as well and take an, op take an opportunity to um, find their way in and double down on their unsupported claims of Indianhood by utilizing their own power and privilege, whether it's education, availability to take on roles of leadership within our community. Well, I'm sorry, my cats keep making guest appearances. I'm so sorry. I shut my door, but the wind blew it open. It's like those French doors. Privilege. I'm just kidding. Um, no, they're just wood doors. Um, no, but um, doubling down their claims. And we've seen this, whether it's coming to art um, opportunities for um, different foundations with substantial grants is that people will, will come in and take advantage of the descendancy and um, reclaiming their identity with no rightful connection to home reservation, whether it's their communities. And while that's another topic of discussion, because transportation is also a privilege to go back home or be mobile between the cities and your, your reservation. But um, I'm sorry, my cat's distracted me. But um, but yeah, there, there's power and privilege in taking on these roles, whether they're on paid, intern, on paid internships and claiming that space that is intended for a native person. So when you talk about the institutional and industrial responsibility to hiring native folks, there is a responsibility to do better um, outreach to our communities and that the interest that people have can change, whether it's, you know, when we talk about diversity is that sometimes they're looking for the the quota native person, brown hair, um, brown hair, brown skin, whether it's someone who's more digestible, that's light skin. This is all determined by like the industrial and systemic racism that it really does change based on what the people with the money have of what they're looking for in native people. I've heard where people say they want a, a brown kid in their work, whereas someone is just as native. So as colorism is still in fact, um, created by folks in power. And I would say white supremacy. It's digestible for them. It's what would garner more audience to have a brown native person. It is really up to them. So, so yeah. I was swearing while you were talking, saying F the words, doing the naughty words. Oh my goodness, digestible. Lookism, right? We could have a blonde, 
uh, blue eye, what it doesn't matter, but the digestible stereotypes, Afton, oh my goodness gracious, thank you for saying that. That's Nicole, I'm passing it to you. Thank you, Afton. That was empowering. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, there, there could be a whole other conversation just on colorism and how colorism shows up, right? And and when you think about, about, again, going back to our federal policies, if you look at slavery and the one drop rule, right? If there was one drop of black blood, they were considered black for the purpose of slavery and keeping them enslaved. Um, and then for native people, we had to prove we had so much blood um, so they could strip us of our land and of our resources um, and ultimately of our identities and our connections um, with each other. And so, you know, I think it's really important that we know what our history was and know what those federal policies were and the impact. This all didn't just happen yesterday, right? Like, it's not just like, oh, it's, you know, it's just what's going on today. This has been, this was planted, right? And when you plant a seed, it grows like someone's watering those seeds, mm -hmm. right? And, and people that are in positions of power and are holding leadership and are holding the carrots, like that's who continues to push to water those seeds and it continues to grow. And then we continue to get um, separated from each other. We get pitted against each other. It's like crabs in a bucket, right? And we'll just keep pull, pulling each other down rather than working together um, to climb up out of the damn buckets, to help each other, um, to work in community with our, you know, all our black and brown relatives um, so that we can all do better, right? Because when we all do better, then we all do better. Like, um, and that's really, you know, that's our indigenous values. That's really at the core of who we were and who I hope we are ultimately trying to get back to is that notion of community um, and the, the spirit that lives in that. And I know we are coming up on three and I can't remember if this went until 3.30 or until three. We did have a comment in the chat. So not on Facebook, I'm not doing Facebook, but we did have a comment. Um, I think that was from the Facebook live. From Mary? From Mary Lyons. Did we already do that? We did not read it, but go ahead. Okay. So greetings from Egypt. Okay, then we were just talking about this topic along with sex slaves, along with many other women issues. So grateful for the organizations like this one. So thank you, Mary. At the end of the day, we do need to talk about indigenous populations across the globe. Indigenous folks are not just native, North American indigenous folks we're dealing with this across the globe right and colorism and lookism and political things all matter so absolutely and yeah. Mary Lyons is from Leech Lake so she's from from here so Mary Meekwitch I'm glad you're watching it's awesome I just have a thought about so there's something about oppression or the way that oppression shows up like we're not we're not the only people who are oppressed right like this is a global multi-generational phenomenon right from across the globe and one of the things that I think about is that I think that sometimes people are attracted to sort of you know a native perspective right I'll I'll really that we value the most is like our, our land, right? Our water, clean water to drink, clean air to breathe, to be connected with our land and our medicines and our language and our ritual, right? Like that's all really anybody wants, no matter where you're from across the globe. And so maybe there's like an attractiveness or something and they wanna be a part of that. But, you know, to me, that means that they have to do their own work on their own oppression and the way that oppression is showing up in their own lives when they want to try to that appropriate somebody else's goodness, right? Like everybody has their own ritual and practice and medicines. And sometimes I'll ask folks, you know, like, what did you take for a cold? You know, what did your ancestors take for when they got a cold or, or a headache or they cut themselves, right? And do you know those answers? And if you don't, how come you don't know those answers? That's by design that none of us 
very few of us really know like what those ancestral medicines were. So I don't know, it's just something that, that we can all do a little piece of so we don't have to go and take other people's stuff, right? <laughs> it's a terrible way to say it, but that's just kind of how I feel about it. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, yeah, if you look at the impact of, you know, oppression and colonization, it's impacted not only Native communities, not only Indigenous communities, right? Because many, um, many white people will say, like, what is my culture? I don't know what my culture is. Like, I don't know what it is to be, you know, Irish or Italian. Like, what are my cultural practices? And so um, when when you don't have access to or know what those are, um, then it looks really, you know, appealing to to grab on to something that doesn't belong to you. Um, and that's not giving an excuse because I don't, um, I'm not saying it is right. Um, but I do see a lot of that happening where then they they grab onto something else that looks very appealing. And the invitation is to do your, do your homework and, and try to understand where that's coming from, right? All of us, we each can do a little bit of self-analysis and trying to understand what connections are we looking for and, and where do we go for those connections that doesn't cause harm to others, right? Mm -hmm. I would like to add too. So there's a book. Um, so we have done at Millsack, I am, with George Floyd and all of the intersections with anti-Blackness, right? This George Floyd happened in our flagship home office area. The house on Sugar Beach, I'll put it in the chat. I'll do an Amazon thing too. But I also wanna share across like our communities, our identities, our ethnicities, our faiths, right? All the things that um, this is not specific to Indian country and our native identities. There are people that are going back to Africa that are traveling from, you know, the lower 48 into Liberia to That's identify and connect with their tribes. Land, all over, right? Like everywhere, yeah. Yes. And then when they, when um, our black African-American slash hybrid love stories, they're also native, can are going back and they're being shut down in Liberia for being African American, African American. So they're being shut down from their tribal rituals, from their communities, from their tribal languages, being shut down. So it really is this global, it's not a phenomenon, that's not the word I want to say. It's global oppression, where people are being shut down for being too much of this, not enough of that, blood quantum here, not enough blood quantum all the things. And if we like build bridges instead of shutting each other down, people come home to their heart speak. We have blood memory, man, right? We have blood memory. We know who our people are. If we are more welcoming, it's going to open doors and do more healing. And folks that um, have dedicated their time and their podcast and whatever to shutting down and doing harm. That's what it is. We are anti-violence up in here. Let's not do violence up in here, right? So, something. I wanna, thank oh, you. Lord. No, you go. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. You know, something that I think about, um, and I, I think there, when we talk about, we there's always an emphasis on being um, more involved within our urban communities and urban hubs, um, and that goes in part of um, a need to reconnect our identities and making sure that we do create a home here in the city. And it makes me think about um, the immense language programs we hear, we have here um, in Minnesota, whether it's the University of Minnesota offering a housing specific for language learners and our allies being more intimately um, within our communities. And, oh my gosh, I'm so done with them. <laughs> um, and how we're inviting more and encouraging more non-Native folks to connect with our culture through language and being a, a useful tool in spreading that knowledge that they have the privilege to receive and the work that should be um, noted and recognized that our languages, um, our culture um, are both intimately connected. And when they participate as an ally with our language, they become a part of our community. 
they are they break bread with us they share their background they kind of broke our conversations with non-native folks and whatever their identity may be so really we need to welcome all and we say in the in the circle welcome to the circle but also welcome to other aspects of our culture because who knows they may be the next grant person they may be the next person that if uh, like holidays are coming up to bring awareness within their own families and their own circles and kinship systems that these are things that are important to the community and I am a part of the community because I contribute even though I am not native so I think about that just bringing it back to um and I hope I'm not speaking over anyone in in the comments I don't want to speak over anyone who's watching that may be an elder and of course there's so much knowledge there but um I think there there are ways to invite our allies and to empower them to contribute and continue the relationship with us that we're not calling you pretendian or outsiders you're not on the outs we welcome you I love that Afton and I do think there's always, um, you know, when we created, it made me think of when we created our shawl project, um, our solidarity shawls, um, we, there was a lot of thought and conversation that went into the creation of those shawls, everything from like the colors, right? Like the red um, fabric to represent us as indigenous women, the purple and the teal um, fringe to represent domestic and sexual violence. Um, but then we talked about who gets to wear those shells and we talked about allies, right? And so, um, and we talked about our allies are absolutely welcome to you to take those shells, but they should be putting them over their arms. They should not be wearing them um, like, like we would wear it, right? To identify us as a native woman. Um, certainly welcome in that circle. We need you and um, we welcome you, but you to be respectful and not appropriate, it should be worn over your arm. Um, and we had a lot of those conversations. We also had conversations about, you know, how to, like, what could our men um, wear? So we had armbands, which were so popular, they're gone because people took them and never gave them back. But, um, but I think, you know, like you said, like allies are really important, but also there should be some you know, some respectful conversations about that and not just appropriate that that, you know, like wearing it over the arm still shows solidarity and support, but isn't trying to take on someone else's culture. Nicole, I want to add too that it's it's not even about policing whether somebody wears a shawl and the shoulders are on their arm. What was most powerful about that was the conversations, the acknowledgement, the deepening of our understanding, the um, the uncomfortableness of us setting clear boundaries and asking to be respected in that way. Um, you know, nobody wants to be shut out of a good thing. So it wasn't about that. It was about this exploration of how do we navigate these like these spaces. So I think that's one of the things that is most scary, but most powerful and the most healing in the long run is, you know, that shared understanding of why it's important to, to make that distinction, right? It's not about shaming you that, but this is, this is how we give and take and there's balance, right? Yeah, it's good stuff. Thank Christine. And I would like to thank you so much, girlfriend. And I want to add to that, that we have, I know there's federally recognized tribes and state recognized and tribal communities, but at the end of the day, and this is what we've experienced. So Pennsylvania has no state or federally recognized tribe. Ironically with Carlisle here, Pennsylvania is like no man's land. We are a very intertribal community. It has come with issues. And some of those issues are, how do you wear your shawl? How, what are your moccasins? How do you wear your leggings? How do you dance? At the end of the day, we're talking about a thousand tribal communities with their own language and song and dance styles and regalia styles. There's a lot of judgy curmudgy happening, but the New Jersey tribes don't dance and wear regalia like Anishinaabe or Clinkett. So there's, it is, I don't know how to say it. There's a lot of judgy curmudgy when we don't have the same traditions. So if you're from Pacific Northwest, how are you judging someone from Oklahoma or Louisiana, right? So it's all just understanding the community that you're seeing. 
So I'm going to keep it real quick. So gathering of nations, the biggest powwow in Indian country, they introduced Eastern war dances like five years ago. And it was the talk of the town because they were the men, the war dancers were wearing nothing but a hatchet and a breech cloth. And I mean, leather, just a square of leather in their back and their front of the parts. Okay. They were the laughing stock of gathering of nations. This happened. Blah, 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 blah. All the gossip, all the mean talking until they were like, oh, we're smoke. We like smoke dancers now. We like the Mohawk dancers now. We like the snake dance and the alligator dance. They were the laughing stock on year one, year two and three of Gathering of Nations. They were the, the smoke dancers and the Eastern war dances were the talk of the town in Gathering of Nations. Just because we don't understand each other's traditional ways of a thousand different ways and languages and faiths and cultures and languages and songs or regalias. At the end of the day, we are a diverse people. So if someone is naked from head to toe, from moccasin to breech cloth, front and back, you know the things I'm talking about, that's an Eastern war dance. Now that's a part of gathering of nations. And you know, gathering a nation's powwow, very diverse, but it didn't exist until just a few years ago. But they were of the laughing stock. And one of my homies was a part of that war dance society where he went in front of everyone and was the laughing stock for a couple of years. So we need to understand that we are diverse. So we can't put each other down for what sounds or looks different than what our own community is. I don't know, does that make sense? But we put each other down. We, we laterally oppress each other because it's different from where we are, but we're supposed to be a diverse people. I don't know, does that make sense? Make, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense to me. It's just about the way oppression shows up, that's all. Yep. And now they're celebrated smoke dancing and alligator dancing at Gathering of Nations is the one of the biggest things. But it used to be put down that they were pretendians, which kind of comes with our, our um, philosophy today. All the things. So it's about 3.15. Um, and I would love to give some, maybe some final thoughts um, or for each of us to give some final thoughts. And Linda has been very quiet. And Linda is um, always has really beautiful things to say. So I'm going to let Linda start. <laughs> I know you have all kinds of wisdom brewing in that head. Not, not necessarily. And anything is growing in my heart. Aww. So I think about um, the tribal values. Um, before you start um, you know, before I start thinking about things and I can tell when somebody is speaking, whether it is in line with what my spirit is saying. And if I feel good about the conversation that's happening, or if it is looking at my sister or my brother, and it's things that are being said that is not true to the way I know them. And so when I think about that, it's not that I have to get up and defend anybody. I don't have to get up and argue about anything. I just have to listen to that part of me. It says, I don't really like this conversation. I don't like gossip. I don't want to be a part of it because it's not good for your soul. It's not good for your spirit. But when we think back, if you don't know your tribal values, you know, you can ask. And a lot of them align with universal truth. So they can look real similar in different tribes that the same things are valued. And there is typically, or what I've seen and experienced, there are ceremonies that acknowledge the making of a relative that is thought to be a very high honor. And in some, you feed the person, you get them, you clothe them, you sing songs, and you let them know that this is, you know, I value you. I value you in my life, in my family, in my, in my world. I'm happy you're here. And we need to do that for each other, not just people that, but remember, learn about those ceremonies, if at all possible, if you have people you can lean into. And even when we hear somebody who 
can has gained the trust and the respect of many in the community because of their ability to pray or to sing or they sit on, you know, they hold a drum or they have um, other duties of responsibility for the people, including prayer, that no matter what, at the end of the day, we're all human. So we can not be right about some things, but we have to be able to listen to this part of us. When you're hearing somebody talk or you're listening to conversations, if we're listening to our own spirit, it'll tell us if this is something I should be a part of or I shouldn't. If it's not my my battle, it's not. If it is something I have an opinion or feelings about, I might need to lean into it. Don't be scared of it and explore it, but do it respectfully so that I can help myself to understand things I don't understand. And I knew this from this morning, when we do check in in the morning with staff, we also have a meditation. So even if our mind is already going in three different ways with tasks for work or things going on in our homes, we are brought together with a meditation. And then we are also um, talking about two things we're grateful for and that we always have things to be grateful for. And if we don't, we need to think about why we're not grateful for even this time together here, um, the use of technology, the voices that you've heard, the voices we've all heard that are coming out through each of us. You know, we just have to be able to listen and to, to know there is not one person who knows all the answers. We all have a piece of this um, puzzle and the sacred knowledge. It's not just for um, certain people, it's for all of us. Um, the prayers are for all people, not just special people or people that are not, you know, deserving of something. We have to think critically about how we're thinking. And I have to, too. I'll never quit learning. I hope I continue learning the rest of this journey. I might know this much, but there's really this much to know. And that's not just for me. That's for all of us. And sometimes ego gets in there with um with all of us and we want to be heard or we want to have time or we want to be right or we want to there's nobody winning i need you to know that that we we all can participate and be a part and and help people to feel honored so many of our people don't feel a place in this whole big circle and when we help them to not to to not even feel like they're a part of certain families we are not being helpful because it's a struggle you have no idea what somebody else is carrying so i'm asking that we could please be good relatives it's not an argument it's it's not a place we can have conversations in a way that is is um peaceful so that we have a better understanding of all of the work that we are doing which typically is is the work of the people and the work of what I think is the creator or however you know the sacred energy that holds us all together, all living things. So that's what I want to say. Thank you, Nicole, for letting me talk. Thank you. I knew there was something beautiful in there. Afton, closing thoughts? Yeah. Um... I think that as a community and as individuals, there's always a starting point. And I know I've made mistakes when it comes down to um, down to this topic. And and I'm sure much more being an imperfect person, you know, creator didn't didn't make me because um, make me a perfect person because that would diminish the um, necessity of a journey and learning experiences. So I. I am so blessed to come across so many people that have instilled this education and conversations and um, disrupt the thought process um, that I may have held before. So I think for anyone, um, use this as a step um, in, in how you treat others and how you even treat yourself and give grace to allies. Um, and even talking about the um, next week is the intertribal communities on Dakota land. Um, 
how we can be in community with each other during these difficult conversations, because um, when these topics exist and they're working conversations that are ongoing, there's a lot of beginnings for a lot of people. So just recognize and give yourself grace in this learning same way you did start off knowing how to ride a freaking bike. <laughs> so kind of treat these tough conversations in the same way um, and talk to your inner child that these are things that you're also learning. Um, so thank you. I, I think Linda kind of summed it up. So I appreciate her as someone who teaches me as well. Thank you, Afton. Christine? Yeah, I echo much what's already been said. I guess for me, you know, it's just a humble, loving invitation for us to do our own internal work and, you know, interrupt our, if, you know, if we feel like, if I feel like I'm about to engage in weaponizing some identities, I want to take personal responsibility for interrupting it. But also there's a next step too, is if I'm seeing weaponizing identities around me to have courage and love enough to say something, right? That's a process for all of us, I think. And that goes with in anti-violence work generally, right? And with sexual violence work and the culture of violence that we live in to have the courage to interrupt it with love, right? I think that's just my open invitation. And anytime you have any gatekeeping power within your organization or within your families or in your relationships just do it with love right like take a risk and, and do it with love because we're all better for it and interrupt harm anytime it's there's an opportunity for harm if we can interrupt it we're stronger for it that's what i would say but me quit rebecca final thoughts Let's just treat each other with love and respect and dignity. That's it, that's all I got, thank you. I love that. And um, Linda, I love that you talked about, you know, us talking about what we're grateful for. I'm certainly grateful for the ability to have these conversations. Um, I'm grateful that we can create space to have these conversations and hope we have many, many more conversations. Um, and I'm grateful for all of you and grateful for everyone watching online. And I too feel like I am always learning and, um, and making mistakes and learning some more. And I'm thankful for all the people who have taught me, even if it was a really hard lesson. Um, and sometimes we don't get those lessons in the nicest way, right? We get the, um, but there's still lessons and I've, and I'm grateful for all those teachings. And so I just want to say chi miigwech to everyone out there watching and to everyone who will watch. And I look forward to many more conversations with you all. <laughs>